Hey y'all, welcome to another edition of the Gamble Ramble. It's your old pal Archie Gamble here. And uh, first of all, I would like to take a second and thank those of you who are tuning in for tuning in. Um, uh, if you've followed this channel and watched videos before, you realize that I did this pretty actively a couple of years back and then took a break as life kind of got in the way. And uh, recently polled friends on Facebook to ask if I would resume, would they in fact support it? And you have responded positively and you have supported it thus far. So thank you very much for that. Um, I've certainly learned from the old uh, uh, vlogs that I posted and took down that uh, I was much scattered and unfocused. And I also learned that from posting on Facebook and asking friends, about content that you want to hear, road stories and stories about my career in music, which has been um, interesting, definitely. Uh, some is successful in terms of uh, cool experiences, very successful. So that's what I think I'm gonna focus on uh, at this point and moving forward. Maybe some odd bits of equipment here and there and other music geek stuff. So today I'm going to tell you such a story and um, this story, as you can see by the title, is about Helix, who I played with from uh, 2000, I'm sorry, 1997 to 2004, seven years. Uh, Helix was on Capital EMI worldwide and four gold, three platinum albums, one double platinum in Canada, number one album in Sweden. Success on MTV and Much Music and American Radio, etc. All of us, of course, before I was in the band, but still the legacy of the band has held up to this day. Vocalist Brian Vollmer is still out there doing his thing, keeping it going, you know, um, burning the flame. So, uh, essentially, there's a many stories I could tell. Well, I will tell one today that I was reminded of uh, in a bit of kismet or, uh, you know, happy circumstance. I was chatting with my good friend, musician Ruben Costa from Bradford. Hi, Ruben. And um, at the end of our conversation on Facebook Messenger, he butt dialed me an R, just an R. And I wrote back, I said, uh, oh, are you asking me to give, give you an R? So for, the, for a frame of reference, those of you that don't know, the Helix most successful song was a song called Rock You, which was written by a songwriter called Bob Halligan Jr. And Bob Halligan also wrote for uh, tons of other bands, most famously Judas Priest. He was kind of like the, um, uh, oh geez, what's that guy's name? The Bon Jovi co-writer of heavy metal bands. Anyway, he was known for writing or co-writing singles for, for certain hard rock heavy metal bands. Although I have to say, and an aside, which I tend to do a lot, Brian Walmer did tell me that he actually changed some of the lyrics in the original version that was written by Halligan. And because of politics, never received songwriting credit, which is a shame because he would have made a lot of money off of it. And that's a topic I'll also touch on after the story. As you can see, my mind is goes to a million places. So anyway, let's go back to about, actually, I don't remember the year, but it, this is a Trailer Park Boys and Helix story, and I'll explain. Um, in the in the early days of the Trailer Park Boys TV show, um, it was just starting to really catch on and become popular. Apparently in one episode, which I'll try and record and put in here if I can, there was a, uh, a Helix reference made. So it's a conversation with Ricky and the camera and it cuts away to a conversation with Bubbles in the camera. And Ricky's favorite band is Helix. He's talking about how he sold a lot of dope at a Helix concert, and it was a wicked concert. And if uh, they asked the band, they are a crowd just shout R, and the crowd shouted R, and O, C, K. That was a wicked concert. And then the camera pans to Bubbles, and Bubbles, who loves Rush and doesn't think very highly of Helix, says, I'm not giving anyone a fucking R. Give me a fucking R. Anyway, it was funny. So the night after, or the, pardon me, the, the, the day after that uh, episode aired, I got phone calls and emails from a lot of friends saying, hey, they mentioned you guys. I was still in Helix at the time. And I think it was around early, early 2000s, it must have been. 
Um, so people were messaging me saying, hey, they mentioned you guys on Trailer Park Boys last night. So I did a little research online and found out about it. It was a pretty funny situation. So at the time I was, uh, the last four years I was in Helix, 2000, 2004, I not only played drums, I road managed the band as well and helped Brian Vollmer with some light office duties and light management duties and stuff. Uh, sometimes it's easier for a representative of the artist to reach out than it is for the artists themselves in the industry. Don't ask me why that is, but it is that way or used to be. So I was at Brian's, I'll never forget this, was at Brian's home, same as his lovely, life, uh, lovely wife Linda, rather, um, in the office and I was doing some work on some upcoming shows, advancing the shows, you know, calling them, faxing, fax, there's a old school, uh, promoters and, and going through the contract and getting a deposit and getting the contract signed and booking flights and hotels and tour support staff and hotel rooms, etc. And Brian came in, he has his coffee, it's Tim Hortons, of course, and uh, I said, hey, we were mentioned on Trailer Park Boys last night. And Brian said to me, what's a Trailer Park Boy? And I had to explain to him about the show. And then it was this hot young uh, comedy, you know, troupe, this, uh, this hot comedy show that was filmed in, in Halifax and uh, and it was very popular and explained the context to him. And as we were talking, I said, you know, we should track down the director and write him an email and say, thank you and send them some Helix shirts, send the, the cast some Helix shirts. So Brian said, get on it. So whenever, you know, I'll give Brian a lot of credit whenever I had an idea that he liked, he was very supportive and said, okay, do it, bring it to me. And then if he liked it, he'd give me full approval. So that's what I did. I somehow through um, TV friends, uh, I think I might have contacted Jessica, uh, Jessica Kappa Bianco, who was a producer at Much Music. And I met Jessica when Brian and I had appeared on an episode of uh, The Power Hour on Much Music, which will be another vlog. I'll talk about that. But Brian was nice enough to include me. Him and I, he and I co-hosted co -hosted an hour long episode. I think she was the person I reached out to being in the TV industry. She said, oh yeah, the person you want to find is a guy named Mike Clattenburg. And I, I won't lie to you, I don't recall exactly how, but I got Mike Clattenburg's email address. It might have been from Jessica. Jessica, thank you if you're watching. And um, so I wrote him and I said, listen, my name is Archie Gable. I'm the drummer and slash road manager of Helix. I'm writing on behalf of Brian Vollmer and myself to say thank you for the shout out on the Trailer Park Boys episode. And, you know, I'm a fan of the show, and uh, it was really funny I hear, and, you know, uh, we, this is the part that's a little murky, I won't lie, that I think, well, I know that I probably said we'd like to send you some t-shirts. Now, I can't remember if we actually did. I, I believe that we did. I believe they gave me an address, and I, we sent some. I'm pretty sure. So, uh, what I do know is what happened, and after a little more correspondence, I said to Mike, well, look, Mike told me he put that scene in there specifically because he was a big Helix fan as a kid. And I said, well, I'm just going to connect you directly with Brian and you guys can talk, right? And uh, here's another gray area. I believe that when I brought up after that email talking to Brian, the guy's name was Mike Clattenberg, I think Brian had worked with him on something or knew him somehow through the industry. And to Brian, if you're watching this, I apologize if it's incorrect, but... Even if that's not the case, they did become uh, acquainted after I hooked them up. So they started writing to each other directly. So it turns out that Clattenburg was a big Helix fan, as I said, which many of us were. You know, as a teenager, I was, right? Um, and the end result was that he invited Brian to come out and shoot a scene with Ricky and Bubbles. And uh, that could possibly be included in an episode, a future episode of the show. And to Brian's credit, Brian invited me to come along. He said, you know, they're flying me out. They're putting me up. You, you can crash in my room on the couch or the floor or whatever. Get you caught. But you have to pay your own effort. Now, at the time, I wasn't gigging a lot. Helix wasn't gigging a lot. I didn't have a lot of money. And I couldn't raise the extra four or 500 bucks to go. Which I regret to this day because Brian said he would have found a way to work me into the scene. Even if I was just sitting there with no dialogue. But what happened was that Brian went and they shot a scene on the set and it was for an episode where Ricky takes over as trailer park supervisor for Mr. Leahy. So 
the scene focuses on Bubbles and and, uh, and he, Ricky, putting up um, outside of the trailer, the office trailer, Ricky's name as new manager. And they discover, of course, that they're short of an R for the name, right? And they're using those, if you remember those tin sticky letters you get at home hardware when we were kids. So Bubbles and Ricky are talking about, Oh, it looks like we need an R, Bubs. Oh, what, where are you gonna get an R? And Ricky's like, give me an R. Oh, I'm not giving you a fucking R, and back and forth. I wonder where we can get an R. And then Bubbles says, oh, I wonder if this fine gentleman over here might have an R. The camera pans over to, to Brian, who is a few feet away, conveniently. And uh, he's um, putting his name on a Porsche. I think it's a Porsche, it's a sports car anyway, with those same letters. And then, of course, the whole dialogue between them develops. Give me an R. I haven't got an R. Come on, man, give me an R. Uh, eventually, Brian decides to trade an R for some hash. Right? So that's never made it into an actual episode, but it did make it into the box set of uh, DVD extra, a DVD extra on the box set of that season. Okay? Which is cool in itself. And again, a regret that I didn't do that because I would have been part of Trailer Park Boys history in a, even just a small little bit. So fast forward and the relationship between Brian and Mike Clattenburg deepens. And Brian gets invited. And this is after I left the band or shortly after I left the band to join the, a band called The Joys, um, which is a full-time gig. Initially, I was going to do both, but there wasn't time. The Joy played over 300 nights a year, so I couldn't serve two masters, right? And um, so Brian got asked to be uh, in the Trailer Park Boys movie. He and Alex Lifeson, I believe, from Rush, did a scene together. And if I'm not mistaken, I think there's two Trailer Park Boys movies, and I think Brian has a cameo in both of them, which is a kind of a cool, lucrative thing for him to have happen so that's cool that was the outcome of that and I'm, and I'm proud of Brian and I'm happy for him and I'm glad that I could have in some small degree facilitated that relationship but here's an interesting side note that's just kind of a B story bonus content pun intended um, so when I was in Helix Brian was recording a solo album and Brian had a side band with three guys from London good band called Tone, uh, I was seven year itch Tony Bill and uh, I forget the other guy's name, but um, so they were doing pre-production, get ready to record on the album, and the, uh, for some reason the drummer wasn't able to play the record or it wasn't working out or something. I don't know. So Brian came to me and asked me if I would play on it, and I said sure, of course, and uh, went into rehearsal pre-production. And as is the case, oftentimes with those situations, the song, some of the songs weren't finished or they were lacking something incomplete. And this is a skill that I'm really good at. I mean, if you put me down with a piano or a guitar or whatever to write a song, I could probably write something rudimentary, but it wouldn't be great. However, if you put that, me down with a, with a writer, I can help finish writing something. And I think anyone that worked with me would say that that's fair to say. Um, and, and that includes suggesting chord changes and parts and primarily arrangements. So anyway, I did a lot of work on these songs and we, we turned them around and filled them out a little bit. So when Brian and I were negotiating the deal for me recording, he came to me and said, well, listen, again, keeping in mind, this is supposed to be a solo project for his band, his solo band. He said, I feel bad about the drummer not playing on it. And he started work on the songs. So. I would like to keep his name in the songwriting credits, but I'll pay you a session fee. So this is a distinction that needs to be made because as a, a side man and a session musician, you know, technically I was entitled to a writing credit as much as anyone else in that room was. And Brian's put the songs four ways. But the way he explained it to me was this. A, he felt bad that the drummer got the boot. Uh, I wanted him to, you know, not be demoralized. And I said, okay, I understand that. And also Brian said, as a solo album, he was probably going to only print a thousand copies. And those thousand copies, you know, if you take 10 songs, 
a quarter share, a one fourth share of each stock. That's not a lot of money, right? But I said, but I'll make it up to you, pay you a good session fee. So that's the terms of agreement we came to. And Brian kept his word, he paid me. We came to a, a dollar figure for the 10, 11 songs recorded. Did the album. Now in the interim, it wasn't working out with the bass player either. Now this is nobody's fault. Tony, the bass player was a great bass player, a great guy, but the studio is a different animal. And sometimes people can't, I don't have studio experience. They're not really used to it. So I brought Stan Fountain in. I brought, suggested Stan would brought him in. And then it morphed into a new Helix album. Long story short. The album that was supposed to be Brian's uh, second solo album, I believe, turned into the Helix album, Rockin' in My Outer Space. So, how is this connected with the Trailer Park Boys, you ask? Well, one of the songs or more were used by Mike Clattenburg in the Trailer Park Boys movie. And possibly an episode of the show, but I can't say that for sure. Um, and yeah, it was uh, licensed to, you know, for the movie. Now, I don't know if it was actually in the film or on the soundtrack, but there was some, the song was called It Just Wanna Be Stoned, right? Which fit in with the Trailer Park Boys theme. So, there's no real point to the story other than to say that perhaps, and it's completely my own fault, I negotiated a not so good deal for myself. Now, granted, you know, I'm fairly knowledgeable, knowledgeable about the industry, but I did this to help a friend. Um, because what would have happened was I would have received So Can BMI performance royalties from appearing on the track in a movie and being a co-writer. And uh, I just basically gave those away. Now, as I said, before anyone jumps to the wrong conclusion, Brian, I believe Brian fully when he said to me that it was supposed to be an initial run of a thousand, which I believe to be 100% true. I don't think he had any intention of it becoming a Helix album or becoming on, on the trailer, use of the Trailer Park Boys soundtrack. So, you know, it's fine. This is the case of it, things, shit happens, as they said, right? But I can't help but think, I mean, sometimes I look at my so can, dwindling so can uh, quarterly statements, I think, ah, oh, there'd be a few hundred dollars, if not a couple thousand dollars more on that if I had, have maybe negotiated a little different or better for myself. But it's water under the bridge and you can't complain about it. And I'm truly happy for Brian that uh, that connection was made and that, that connection led to some uh, promotion, success, finance, financial success, perhaps, for Brian. And uh, I had a small part in it. So, you know, again, never to be misunderstood that I'm trying to go, I, I, me, me, me. But it just, it's a story that goes to show you that behind the scenes, little things can happen. Ripple, like a rock, skipping stone, ripples and waves, right? If someone hadn't have reached out to me and told me the Trailer Park Boys had mentioned us, I would never have known. If I had mentioned Brian and then contacted Clattenburg, Brian would never have made the connection and been in the movie, perhaps. In fact, I'm pretty safe to say that it, pretty safe bet, bet to say that it wouldn't have happened. But that said, you know, if my aunt had nuts, she'd be my uncle, right? It's just a thing. Anyway, I'm proud of my connection with one of Canada's uh, greatest hard rock bands. I still am to this day. Brian called me. And uh, I wish them well. And I wish you well. And I really appreciate you listening to me telling my rock and roll tales. And I hope everyone is safe and well and happy and healthy. Uh, thanks again.